Hello, this is Jack from Teaching ESL Online, and joining me today to talk about her online teaching business is Shayna Oliveira. Shayna, welcome to Teaching ESL Online. Hi, Jack. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. So, uh, firstly, can you just introduce yourself and talk about your website and how you got into this online teaching? Yeah, sure. So I was teaching offline in Brazil. My husband is Brazilian, so we live there together. And I was teaching private and group classes at some local schools. And it was great. I love teaching, but the pay was not ideal and the schedule was all over the place. And what gave me the idea to start teaching online was I had a couple of students who were working mothers and they also had really busy schedules. And they said, Shana, I can't get to class all the time. They would miss, you know, maybe a third or a half of their classes, but can you just send me some email lessons and I'll study on my lunch break? Cause it's the only time I have during the day, you know, I have a one year old, you know, child and I have a job and, but I can do my lunch break if you send me email lessons. And so that was what kind of sparked the whole online thing. So I started sending them email lessons and then I started posting those lessons on a blog and that was kind of the genesis of Espresso English. Great. So um, obviously this this was started by trying to solve someone's problem by just sending them email lessons, but then you decided to put this on your blog. And then did you have a vision for this when you started doing it? Did you think about where it might lead? Well, the first thought I had was I could reach a lot more people this way because instead of just giving a class, you know, language classes are usually small. That's ideal, right? You know, just I think uh, I would teach about eight people at a time. And usually I would I would use a lesson and it would be a great lesson, but then I couldn't use it again until the next semester with another group of eight. And I realized when I started putting these things online that this could reach 100 people or 200 people or more and it could stay online forever as opposed to just reaching very tiny groups of people um so that was uh what initially the vision i initially had as well as the benefits for me uh in terms of being more free to control my own schedule and being able to travel and not be reliant on the english school's schedule for me sure and so did you start with one-to-one -one lessons online did, did you actually teach through skype or another platform I actually didn't because I was doing one-to-one -one lessons offline and um, I just didn't really want to bring that online at the time. I wanted to do more of a one-to-many thing right from the beginning. Right. So um, I, after you started to make a few lesson plans and put those lessons on your blog, what, what was the next step for you? Did you start making videos or do something else? Well, that first step lasted actually quite a long time. I spent about five or six months just posting really consistently uh, lessons every day on the blog and or nearly every day and they would be short so it wasn't very time consuming to just write something up and i would usually take inspiration from my offline classes if somebody asked me about something i would reply to them in class and then when i got home i would type it up and post it on the blog and over that time uh, traffic to the site was building slowly um, my email list was building slowly and my very first product that I launched was actually an ebook called 100 Common Errors in English. And this was also drawn from my offline classes. I would just kind of take note of, you know, the mistakes people made. And then I wrote up a, a little ebook on, on the topic. So that was my first paid product. And uh, when did you introduce that first, your first ebook? It was about six months in. Uh, but by that time, I already had a a small email list that had been accompanying my blog lessons and when I launched it it wasn't a huge rush of purchases but it was a few you know people who liked my lessons and it was encouraging enough for me to think okay I could keep going and maybe do a more complex product maybe a course or a video or something like that but at this point I wasn't even doing any videos I was only doing text text lessons Sure. So, so everything was like text based on your on your website. Um, let, let's actually just talk about where you are now and then we can go back and fill in some gaps. So what, where is Espresso English right now? What, what, what kind of products do you have and what kind of audience do you have? OK, so fast forward about um, three years now, uh, there are three ebooks, nine courses, and I also have a monthly subscription program whereby students can receive lessons and also send me their writing and send me their speaking and I will give them some comments on it. And that's 
they pay monthly for that service. And so these are all things I've developed over the last three years. Um, the community is pretty large. I have about 40,000 people on my email list receiving lessons and about 300,000 people a month who visit the website. So from that small beginning, it's now grown quite a bit. Wow, so you must have seen some real exponential growth during that time. You know, I wouldn't call it exponential. I would just call it slow and steady. Just, you know, every month, just getting a little bit better, a little bit better. There was really never one point in time where I would say things, you know, took off or there was never a really pivotal uh, strategy that I use. It just, I would just try to get a little bit better every month and the traffic would slowly go up and the number of students would just keep going. So it's just been kind of slow, slow and steady wins the race kind of thing. Great. And um, during this time, you were actually juggling um, a part-time job. Is that right? Yeah, I had about um, a quarter-time job. So in addition to the offline teaching, I was working about 10 hours a week for a web development client in the United States. And this was a client who I had previously worked full-time for, and then I transitioned to a more of a quarter-time role and that was good when I started out because it did take some of the pressure off because that quarter time job actually covered my living expenses so I didn't feel like I have to generate you know revenue really fast with Espresso English um, and I held on to that quarter time job for quite a long time actually just because I wanted to be sure that the website was stable enough to support me and my husband Great. And um, how did you feel about making that transition from having that quarter time job and your offline teaching into going full time with your business? Well, the offline teaching was actually the first thing to go because it ate up a lot of hours. And when I looked at the hourly rate that I was actually receiving between going on the bus to the language school and lesson preparation, I realized that um, it wasn't an ideal use of my time. So I actually left the English school, the offline English school, uh, pretty early on, but then I kept the quarter time online job for another two and a half years. And I have to confess that when I was going to leave that job and go full time with Espresso English, I was about to do it once and I chickened out because of a, a low month in sales. And um, it's really silly looking back on it. I actually could have left at that point, but I really wanted to be sure. I really wanted to be prudent about jumping in full time. And so I really only left the quarter time job once it actually became difficult to impossible to really do a good job on both commitments. And then I realized, okay, now it's, it's time to, to go. <laughs> That, that, that's really interesting because, you know, I, as you say, it's, it's very difficult to invest everything into the, an online business like this. Um, and you're trying to think about the perfect time to do it. And you know, in the back of your mind that if I have more time to work on it, then that's going to increase the sales um, and everything else that you do. But at the same time, it's, it's, it's kind of scary to make that, that leap. It is, and especially because my model was and is really one-time purchases. Most of my courses, you know, every month I'm starting from zero and I have to see who's going to, you know, purchase the course again, you know, that, that month. And, um, but I, I did have some numbers in mind where I said, okay, if it stays at this level, you know, I had a really good idea of our living expenses. And I knew that if Espresso English could be at this level consistently and not fluctuate, you know, too much up and down, of course, there are going to be some natural uh, fluctuations, then I can feel comfortable in letting go of the other income source. And it, it did reach that point. And also I discussed with my husband, he was comfortable with it and uh, we were able to make that decision. And it really was ideal timing, um, despite the earlier chicken out. Sure, yeah. Um, so let's just talk a little bit more about how you have built Espresso English. So what, what kind of things have been really important for you in terms of, in terms of the growth of the, the website and the business? Um, lots and lots of free content. Uh, my entire business is built on the blog. And as I mentioned, when I started, I just had the blog. And about a year and a half into it, then I started getting on YouTube. And what I initially did was actually very simple. I'm camera shy. I don't like being on camera. And so what I did was I just 
took my blog posts, made PowerPoint slides of them, and then just voiced over the PowerPoint slides. So it was very easy, low pressure, and I would toss those onto YouTube. And those actually were quite popular. People liked that kind of clear presentation of the material. Um, and so my blog was my first major channel for growth. YouTube is my second, and just this year I've also added a podcast uh, so that people can, you know, download the audio and be able to listen to it on their commute or when they're away from their computer. So that's now becoming, I guess, a new engine of growth for me. Great. Um, yeah, you mentioned those presentation style videos. I think another advantage of those is that you can just churn them out much quicker than when you're on camera. Um, and for people first getting started, it's a, it's a great way to ease into, into making videos for YouTube. Yeah, it really is. I felt very comfortable doing it. And actually now I'm beginning to experiment with some on-camera videos. Uh, but it was good to have had the experience of the PowerPoint voiceovers. Not only that, but if I need to change or tweak anything in the slides, it's very easy to just change a slide and re-record maybe that section of the audio. Um, and most of my videos are only two to four minutes long. So as you said, I can sometimes do a whole month's worth of videos in just a day and you know get those lined up and, and out of the way. So it's not very time consuming at all. No, it's, it's such an important part, especially when you talk about how you've, you've grown Espresso English by giving lots of free content and to be able to actually create this content and to get a schedule for it is so important because to stay consistent and to continue with the growth. And one of the things that I would use at the beginning is I didn't, when I was first starting out and I was working at the English school and with the quarter time job and trying to start Espresso English, I really didn't have large blocks of time to work on it. And what I would try to do is just try to get 15 minutes here and there. So maybe I would arrive at the English school 15 minutes before my class. I would just kind of jot down some notes for a potential blog post. And then my student would arrive, I'd give the class. Then later I'd get home, I'd have just 15 minutes, I'd type it up. And then I wouldn't have time to do anything else. And then later that evening, maybe I'd um, uh, add some images or some other just tiny, tiny task. And just 15 minutes at a time, I was able to generally get a post out every day, even though I didn't have, I prefer to have several hours to you know dig my teeth into uh, project, but just getting those scraps of time actually made it possible to do a lot of progress, even though um, I had a lot of other commitments. Great, fantastic. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about your um, membership uh, site now. So you have some standalone courses where it's a one-time fee to, to, to get access to the course. We also introduced the monthly subscription. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I call this uh, subscription premium lessons. And what it is, is every week students receive three lessons from me. And one's based on an article, one's based on a dialogue, and one's called uh, Ask the Teacher. So it's just a, a video of me responding to some student questions. And as part of that, they can also send me their writing once a week. They can send me their speaking. They can record it themselves or through a service I use called SpeakPipe where people can leave online voice messages. And then I will give them feedback on their written and spoken English. Not everybody chooses to take advantage of that part, but those who do get a lot of benefit out of it. And so I launched this program and it saw lower adoption than my standalone courses. I think the program is not right for everybody. It's a little bit more advanced. And also you have to you know, keep up with the commitment of doing the lessons. Uh, but those who are doing it are enjoying it and getting a lot out of it. I've gotten a lot of great comments on the program. Um, and it's really just the content. I decided not to include at the moment any sort of community aspect. Maybe I'll add that in the future, such as a private Facebook group or a forum or something like that. But it, I wanted to launch it with just the basics, just regular lessons and feedback from the teacher. And that was, you know, good. A, a solid number of people signed up and they've stayed in the program for a couple of months so far. Great. Um, and what, what, what made you decide to, to choose that model? Because I know a lot of teachers think about choosing that model and, and shy away from it and instead go for standalone products. But what, what made you actually adopt this and go forward with it? Well, the reason 
I initially shied away from it was because I was nervous about keeping up the pace of the content yeah. production. And I didn't want to launch it until I was sure that I had enough students who would be signing up and, you know, continue in the program. What pushed me over the edge towards launching it was the fact that I did notice that I had a lot of repeat students in my various programs. So I would see someone sign up for business English, and then a couple months later, the same person would sign up for pronunciation. And then maybe a couple months later, they'd purchase my ebook on collocations. And so I realized that there were indeed people who wanted more and more uh, lessons from me. So they were signing up for all of my courses. Uh, and I figured this would be a new way to serve uh, that interest in receiving continuous lessons. And also I wanted to add in the feedback part because I think that's one of the most valuable things when you can get that direct feedback on your English. Even though it's not a private lesson, you're still getting a, a native speaker's and a teacher's comments and explanations and corrections. And I knew that there was a, gonna be a subsection of my audience who was interested in getting that kind of feedback. Definitely, yeah. And I, as you said before, not everyone does this because I've had courses with this aspect to it where there's writing feedback or speaking feedback and not everyone actually goes through with it, but those who do, they get so much out of it. Yeah, I even have a couple of people who are non-native English speakers, but they're teachers in their own countries and they really want to keep their skills sharp and make sure that, you know, they don't have any errors. They're not, you know, teaching something that's not correct. And so they send me their writing. I correct any small errors and give them an explanation so that they know uh, what's going on. And they said this is super valuable because since they're already at a very high level, oftentimes they don't have anybody who can correct them or who can help them refine their English even further. Great, fantastic. Um, let's move on now to email marketing because you mentioned before that you um, have this email list. What, when did you start, start in, implementing email marketing into, into the website? The week it was launched. That was one of the best decisions that I think I made in my business was from the moment the site was online, I had an email sign up. And Initially, I would just send out the week's new posts. You know, uh, I think my first email went out to 12 people or 18 people or something like that, really small group. Um, but every week I would always send out the new posts. And so it became consistent. People eventually would look forward to receiving Espresso English emails in their inbox. And uh, of course, you know, as, as the list grew, you know, more and more people would receive that uh, email. And most of my sales, come from students who have been receiving my lessons, they're familiar with my teaching method, uh, they connect with me as a teacher, uh, I've provided a lot of value already, and then they're motivated to purchase a course, which in every email I do have opportunities, links to purchase a book or a course on a subject that's related to that week's lesson topic. So it's always there, and um, I haven't missed a week in three years of emailing people. It's fantastic. It's amazing. So, the, you know, just a, another example of the consistency in terms of sending information out on a weekly basis, always been there. And as you say, also, also um, mentioning your courses in each email too. You, you have a little phrase for this, don't you? Um, where you talk about always, I can't remember what, what you say. Oh, yes. Uh, was my personal approach to selling was always present and never pushy. Um, because I was uncomfortable with some of the marketing tactics that are used, especially in language learning. You really can't overpromise. I mean, you can make a course that's extremely helpful and that people love, but you can't promise somebody that they're going to be fluent in, in a month or that this course is going to be the answer to all of their problems. And so I really struggled for, for a while with how to sell ethically and honestly. And basically now I just view it as an invitation. If I send out, for example, my email yesterday was six tricky consonant clusters. So it was difficult things to pronounce in English. And then at the end of the email it said, if, and if you want to really get a comprehensive improvement of your pronunciation, sign up for my pronunciation course, because it covers all of these combinations, vowels, intonation, word stress. And so it's just more of a natural continuation as opposed to something that people feel like they're pressured into or pushed into. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, so what, what are your plans for the future with Espresso English? Because now you have the, the monthly membership. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that you're thinking about doing? Are you just looking just to keep building? 
the first thing I would really like to do is actually to go back to all my courses and improve them based on the student feedback I've gotten from people who have already been through it. Um, some of it will be improving the quality of the videos. For example, right now I have, I have a lot of PowerPoint voiceovers, but I want to maybe intersperse those with me on camera teaching a little bit and then cut to a slide. So start to get a little bit more sophisticated in terms of video production, as well as adding some features where people can, for example, check off that they finished the lesson so they can really keep track of their progress. Um, at the moment, it's very, it's just a list of lessons and someone has to remember where they are in the course, but just things to improve the learning experience, I guess. Um, and I'm also open to adding more courses in the future based on what people are asking for, maybe some more specialized topics um, within business English or something like that. Uh, but I don't want to actually get too many because then it can be overwhelming when someone is trying to choose which course is right for them. So I want to keep the number of courses relatively small but high quality. So I think that's my next project is improving the quality of all 12 or 13 things that I have for sale. And that's probably going to take me another three years. So <laughs> that's the short term plan. Yeah, it's, it's funny you mention that because I was thinking about the, doing something very similar because I have a lot of, in the Tefaluta program, I have the, the PowerPoint presentations and I was thinking about, and I've started to do this, just add me at the end of the, at the, end of the video or at the start of the video, at the end of the, the module, just to, kind, just to try and give that variety and mm -hmm. to give it a different um, you know, style, I guess. Um, but as you say, there's a lot of work when you actually look back at a course think about how can I make this better to refilm it as well. And it, it's, it's a lot of work, but it's um, definitely something that's going to help you improve your courses for, for your learners. And getting feedback from your learners is important too. Uh, I was initially a little bit nervous about asking for feedback because I, you know, I wasn't sure if people really were satisfied, you know, with what they had purchased. And most of the feedback I've gotten has been overwhelmingly positive. And one of the questions I actually include is, if you could add one lesson to this course, what would it be on? And so this is fantastic because now I've gotten, you know, 15 or 20 additional lesson ideas that could actually make really good either lessons for when I revise the course and add some more material or bonuses. Um, and you know these are all student generated you know so I, I don't have to worry about running dry of ideas because they're actually giving me the ideas for improving the course um so basically when someone signs up uh, for a course about 60 days after they've purchased they just get that feedback email automatically so i have it set up with my email system that they will be automatically asked for feedback um, and i just have a little five question survey for them to fill out and so it's very it's very easy to get those kind of comments. Great. I am, I'm very sophisticated with the, the email autoresponders, you know, being able to ask that question and being sent to a form and then everything is really automated in a, in a really good way. Yeah, it's nice because uh, once set up, it's very hands off and I just read the responses as they come in. I get notified um, and then I can read through and decide, you know, what I want to implement in, in the next version of the course, the upgraded version. Great. Well, uh, Shana, thank you so much for your time today. It's been really inspirational hearing um, your story. And wh where can teachers find you? Wh where can they get in contact with you? Um, I'm at EspressoEnglish.net. Uh, that's where I have all my material for learners, but there's also, of course, a contact form. And I'm always happy to interact with teachers and aspiring online teachers or people who are already doing something online to give tips or just exchange some ideas. And so, anyone can get in touch through my contact form at espressoenglish.net. Great. Well, thanks again, Shana, and uh, speak to you soon. All right. Thanks, Jack. Take care. Bye-bye.